everyone! This week we're going to talk about the last two dynasties of the Middle Kingdom. Just a heads up, this is the last period we're going to cover because this is the last week of the course. Today we're going to cover the 13th and 14th dynasties. Now, some Egyptologists place these within the Second Intermediate Period, but others place them at the end of the Middle Kingdom. These dynasties were quite unstable, with the kings only ruling for about 10 to 15 years each. There were almost 110 kings during these two entire dynasties. Many of them are recorded on the Turin Canon Papyrus and other inscriptions, such as scarab seals, but often this is the only thing we know about them. I'm just going to cover some of the general events and the most famous pharaohs from these periods. So let's get started. First, I just want to cover some of the most important historical documents from this time period. These were known as scarab seals. They became popular in the Middle Kingdom and were used throughout the rest of Pharaonic history. In the ancient Egyptian religion, the sun god Ra was associated with a scarab beetle, as he would roll across the sky each day, like a beetle rolls a dung ball. These amulets depict the beetle with a flat base that is usually decorated with either geometric patterns or hieroglyphs. Those with hieroglyphs usually contain the cartouche of a king and are known as scarab seals or scarab seal impressions. These amulets were usually carved out of stone or made with Egyptian faience, which is a blue glass-like material. They could be worn on a necklace or even be made into a ring. The scarabs were mainly used as official seals for kings or high nobles. Often the presence of a scarab, which are usually very well preserved, can help date an archeological layer to the year of that ruler. This does make it extremely difficult when scarab seals are found belonging to a previously unknown king. The 13th dynasty was a direct continuation of the 12th dynasty, as it seems the kings continued to rule over Middle and Upper Egypt. In later texts, this dynasty was described as one as chaos and disorder, but that may not entirely be true. It may have actually been quite peaceful, as it seems the central government continued to rule out of the capital, Itawi, in the Fayum. This period waged for almost 154 years with almost 60 different rulers. Although the first few rulers seem to be related to the last rulers of the 12th dynasty, the majority of the other kings seem to be completely unrelated to each other. Some may actually have been born as commoners or nobles. Some of the kings of this period have at least been preserved in some relief and statuary. Sekhem Re Kutawe Sobekhotep I, who is sometimes known as Amenemhet Sobekhotep, was the first king of the 13th dynasty. He is mentioned in Cahoon Papyrus 4, which is a census of a household of a local lector priest. This papyrus helps establish that Sobekhotep I ruled sometime close to the rule of Amenemet III. He may have built a Hebsed chapel in Medamund and other structures in Deir al-Bahri and Luxor. It was originally speculated that Sobekhotep I was buried in a tomb in Abydos, labeled S10. This is in a royal necropolis that dates to the Middle Kingdom and Second Intermediate Period and is close to the funerary complex of Sanusret III. The tomb's owner was completely unknown until 2013, when a relief bearing the name Sobekhotep was found. Because of this, it was originally attributed to Sobekhotep I, but as of 2015, it has now been attributed to Sobekhotep IV. Unfortunately, the tomb of Sobekhotep I is still not known. The fifth king of the 13th dynasty was Ameni Kamau. His name is not found in the Turin Canon Papyrus and is only attested from canopic jars found in his tomb. Even though he may have only ruled for two years, he still had a pyramid built. This pyramid is located in Dashur and is completely ruined. It was probably only 50 square meters at the base and 35 meters tall. The burial chamber was made out of a single block of quartzite and was hewn to receive a sarcophagus and canopic jars. A tomb nearby that is thought to be of Ameni Kamau's daughter was also found with a wooden box and canopic jars, still containing the viscera of the princess. The next pharaoh we're going to cover is Abre Hor. Again, he probably only ruled for a few years and maybe even only a few months. He is mostly known from his intact tomb, where this wooden statue of him was found. This statue was life-size and was found within a wooden shrine. What is very intriguing about this statue is the hieroglyph for Ka, which stands upon his head. The Ka arms indicate that this was a vessel for the pharaoh's Ka to reside in in the afterlife. His tomb was discovered in 1894 and was nearly intact. 
Because he ruled for such a short period, the tomb was just a shaft that was built next to the complex of Amenemet III in Dashur. It was probably originally made for one of Amenemet's courtiers, but then enlarged for Abre Hor. It contained a burial chamber and antechamber where the Ka statue was found. The tomb contained a partially gilded coffin, which was badly rotted. The funerary mask originally had eyes set in bronze, and the gold gilding was found scraped off. The canopic box was found complete with all four vessels. Some other items in the tomb included jewelry, alabaster stella, and a number of flails, scepters, and wooden staves. Only the ransacked skeleton of Hor was left in the coffin. We're going to skip ahead to Usurkare Kenenger, who was the 21st pharaoh of the 13th dynasty. He probably ruled for only four or five years. Because of his unique name, which is equated with the Semitic personal name Henzer, meaning boar, he might be the earliest known Semitic king of a native Egyptian dynasty. Kenenger most likely ruled out of Memphis, especially because he built his pyramid complex in nearby Saqqara. The pyramid seems to be completed because a fragmented black granite pyramidion has been found. This would make it the only pyramid complex to be completed in the 13th dynasty. The complex had a pyramid, north temple, mortuary temple, two enclosure walls, and a satellite pyramid. It is located between the pyramids of Pepi II and Senusaret III. The main pyramid is mostly in ruin, unfortunately due in part to the excavations in the 1920s. It was originally built with a mud brick core and limestone casing stones. The entrance had a long staircase with a granite porticullis, then another staircase and porticullis, and finally the antechamber. A porticullis is a type of stone gate which would help deter tomb robbers. Unfortunately, the porticullises in this case were both left open in the main and satellite pyramid. Finally, the burial chamber was also carved out of a single block of quartzite, which held the sarcophagus and canopic chest. The North Temple had a raised platform, a yellow quartzite false door, and fragments of reliefs showing offering bearers. Very little of the mortuary temple remains, except for some pieces of relief and bases of columns. The satellite pyramid was actually made for both of his two queens. A small staircase led to two porticullis chambers, an antechamber, and two burial chambers. The lids of the quartzite sarcophagi were found propped open with blocks, as they should be before any burial, indicating that no one may have ever been buried here. Some scholars have speculated that the interruption of the burial of Kenedra's queens may have occurred because he was usurped by Semim Kare in the Remes Ha. Imi Remes Ha is most well known for the two colossal statues of him, which are now at the Egyptian Museum in Cairo. The statues are probably made for the Temple of Ptah in Memphis, but were later usurped by the 15th dynasty Hyksos kings Akenen Re Epepi and moved to the capital of Avaris. Later they were moved to both Ramses II's capital Pi Ramesses and to Tanis in the 21st dynasty, where they were found in 1897. It is interesting to note the similarities in facial features between Imi Remes Ha and Senuzaret III, such as the large protruding ears. Because I want to cover as many of the pyramids of ancient Egypt as possible, I want to quickly cover the southern South Saqqara pyramid, which was unfinished and no owner has been determined. It dates to the 13th dynasty and is renowned for having one of the most elaborate substructures since the 12th dynasty pyramids. The substructure of the pyramid, which is also called an hypogeum, changes direction and level several times and was planned to have four particulises. There was a long storage hallway and two sarcophagus chambers. The sarcophagi were made out of monolithic pieces of quartzite, but seem to have never been used. The smaller chamber may have been used for the burial of a queen or the ka of the king. Through the complicated design of the hypogeum, it would have been impervious to robbers. Although there is indication that the robbers were able to enter the pyramid in antiquity, they most likely found it empty. There is no evidence of which 13th dynasty king built this pyramid. Some scholars have proposed that this was the tomb of Imi Remes Ha, or even his successor, Shetep Kare Intef, while others have proposed the later wealthier kings, two of which I'm going to talk about now, although they have tombs that are tentatively associated with them. Kasa Kemre Neferhotep I is one of the best attested kings of the 13th dynasty, ruling for about 11 years. He seems to have come from a non-royal family in Thebes with a military background. A man named Haung F is recorded in the Turin Canon Papyrus as the father of Neferhotep I, which is an extremely rare occurrence because the name of a non-royal is not typically included. He is known for a relatively high number of objects that are attested to him. 
These can be found all throughout Egypt and even as far north as Byblos and as far south as Lower Nubia. The majority of these are scarab seals and rock inscriptions. The statue on the left was found in the Naos of Neferhotep at Karnak and depicts Neferhotep I with his brother and successor Sobekhotep IV. It seems that he held a co-regency for a few months with his younger brother Sihathor before he predeceased Neferhotep I. Then it is possible that he appointed his other brother Sobekhotep IV to be his co-regent and heir after his death. The tomb of Neferhotep I has been tentatively assigned to tomb S9 in Abydos. Because the neighboring tomb S10 has been associated with Sobekhotep IV, it has been concluded by scholars that this tomb was associated with Neferhotep I. It consists of a mud brick enclosure wall, a small rectangular chapel, and an entrance to the substructures. The passage leads to a porticullis, another chamber with two more porticullises, and a burial chamber made out of three blocks of quartzite sandstone. Burned wood and bandages, pieces of inscribed gilded plaster from a mummy mask, faience inlay, stone jars, and beads have been found in and around the tomb. The superstructure of the tomb could have been in the shape of a mastaba or even a pyramid, based on the similarities between the substructures of this tomb and the tomb of Kenedjer. Again, Sobekhotep IV was most likely the brother of Neferhotep I, meaning that he came from a non-royal family. He may have reigned for about eight years and probably conducted building work in Abydos and Karnak. He also conducted an expedition to the Amethyst Mines at Wadi el Hudi. It is believed that he ruled over Memphis, Middle Egypt, and Thebes, but not over Upper Egypt. Although scholars still argue about this, the 14th or 15th dynasty kings may have been in control of the Delta region in Upper Egypt around this time. As I mentioned previously, tomb S10 in Abydos was originally attributed to Sobekhotep I, but is now believed to be that of Sobekhotep IV because of the style of the tomb. The complex had a rectangular brick-walled structure, possibly in the shape of a mastaba or pyramid. The substructure consisted of limestone-paved corridors that led to the burial chamber. Interestingly, the red quartzite sarcophagus was found in a later royal tomb nearby, called CS6 and planks from the cedar coffin in S10 were used by a later king named Seneb Kai in a neighboring tomb, CS9. These pieces had remnants of the coffin texts, which are funerary texts that were later iterations of the pyramid texts. The last pharaoh we're going to talk about from the 13th dynasty is Mer Nefer Re I. He is presumably the longest reigning king of this period, ruling for over 23 years. He probably usurped the throne from his predecessor, Wahib Re Ibayu. Merneferi Ray I is attested on 62 scarab seals from Abydos, Koptos, Lisht, Bubastis, and Heliopolis. The photo on the right shows an obsidian jar with his cartouche that is now in the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. A pyramidium with his name was found in 1908, but it is unclear if this was for his pyramid, as no such complex has been found. The pyramidion probably came from Memphis, but was found in the 14th dynasty capital of Avaris. Merdifer Ai was the last Egyptian king of the 13th dynasty who was attested from objects outside of Upper Egypt. This may indicate that the capital city of Itali was abandoned in favor of the southern capital of Thebes, which could have been triggered by an invasion of the eastern delta and Memphite region by Canaanite rulers. Some scholars believe that this change marks the end of the Middle Kingdom, but others remark that later kings could have still ruled from Memphis. This is a list of all the remaining kings of the 13th dynasty, which for the most part we know very little about. There are four kings also listed here that probably ruled during this period, but their chronological position is not known. The 13th dynasty fell to the conquest of the Hyksos rulers of the 15th dynasty around 1650 BCE. If you thought we didn't know a lot about the 13th dynasty, we know even less about the 14th dynasty. Scholars continue to argue whether or not it should be placed at the end of the Middle Kingdom or the beginning of the Second Intermediate Period. It either lasted about 75 years or 155 years, depending on the scholar. It has been concluded that this dynasty occurred at the same time as the 13th dynasty and most likely ruled out of Upper Egypt in the Delta. Some argue that this dynasty began shortly after the rule of Sobek Neferu in the 12th dynasty, while others argue that it emerged in the mid 13th dynasty. The capital was probably a city called Avaris, which is located at the archeological site called Tel El Daba. Also, these rulers have been identified as being of Canaanite or Semitic descent. This has been concluded based on the West Semitic origins of many of the names of kings and princes. 
The majority of the kings listed here were found in the Turin Canon Papyrus, but some have been added by other scholars based on the dating of scarab seals. There is very little evidence of any relief or statuary of these pharaohs, as the majority of the information we know about them comes from the Turin Canon Papyrus and scarab seals. I'm only going to cover three kings of this period, which are the most well known. In terms of the number of artifacts attributed to him, Sheshi Maeb Rey was one of the best attested kings of this period. 396 scarab seals of his have been found throughout Egypt, Cana, Nubia, and even as far as Carthage. This map shows some of the locations that the scarab seals were found. Although this map is quite extensive, due to the small and portable nature of scarab seals, over 80% of his seals have an unknown provenance. There are three competing hypotheses regarding to what dynasty Sheshi belonged to. Some scholars believe that he was the founder of the Hyksos 15th dynasty. Others think that he was part of a combined 15th and 16th dynasty, where they see him as a vassal of the Hyksos, who ruled semi-independently from them. And finally, there are those who think that he was part of the 14th dynasty, who were still Semitic, but ruled before the Hyksos invasion. An Egyptologist named Kim Reiholt, who has done extensive work on the second half of the Middle Kingdom and the chronology of kings of this era, believes that Saheshi and his consort Tati were the parents of the next king, Naheshi Asa Rey. This is based on similar stylistic markers of the scarabs of these three rulers. He also believed that there may have been an alliance with the 14th dynasty kings and the kingdom of Kush in Nubia, as the name Tati is attested as an earlier Kushite queen, and Nehesi's name literally means the Nubian in Egyptian. Nehesi may have had a brief co-regency with his father based on four scarabs that have been found. He also may have become heir to the throne after his older brother Ipiku died. Besides scarab seals, he is also attested on multiple stella, a fragmentary obelisk seen here, and possibly a seated statue which was usurped by a 19th dynasty king. The final king of the 14th dynasty that I'm going to mention is Mer Jedef Are, who again is one of the only kings that has any objects associated with him other than the Turin Canon Papyrus. He is mentioned on the stella of a royal seal bearer and treasurer named Rani Soneb. The stella probably originates from Rani Soneb's tomb in the southeastern delta. It depicts Mer Jedef Are making offerings to Soped Har Soped, who is the god of the sky and the eastern border regions. Mer Jedef Are most likely only ruled for three to four years, which may have been one of the longest reigns of the 14th dynasty. This is a list of several of the rulers who are known from contemporary artifacts, but are not listed on the Turin Canon Papyrus. They may date to the 14th or the 15th dynasties. Again, their chronological position is not known, and their identity is only known from scarab seals. After the reign of Nehesi, the Delta region may have been struck by a prolonged famine or even a plague, which lasted until the end of the 14th dynasty and may have even struck some of the last 13th dynasty kings. This weakened both kingdoms, which may explain why it fell so easily to the Hyksos rulers of the Second Intermediate Period. Thank you so much for learning about the first half of Egyptian art, history, and archaeology with me. I hope to see you back with my next lectures about the second half of Egyptian history, starting from the Second Intermediate Period all the way to the Greco-Roman period. Thanks, and stay safe. Mm -hmm.